Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. He set them in place forever, forever and ever. He gave a decree that they will never pass away. Well, good morning. How is everyone doing this morning? Who's all going to the fair this week and enjoying the lovely 90 degree weather? That should be, that should be great. Nothing, nothing like a sticky hot fair to go through. I, I can't wait. Well, we have a, we have a couple announcements here um, to make the, the body aware of. Beginning September 15th, that's right around the corner, five days past my birthday, in case you were wondering, you know, just to throw it out there. Yeah, 38 years old. Thank just, you. Just what to get you, right? Just what to get me. Absolutely. Give me a hard time. That's what most get me. I will have a Wednesday evening discipleship opportunity on the first and third Wednesday of the month. Adults will be watching and discussing the Chosen series, and programming for children will be available. And I'm going to have Amber come up and say a word about that, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, we need people to sign up um, in the narthex, and she'd like to put a little pressure on you right now. That's what I understand. Morning again. Good morning. Good morning. Um, as I said last week, we are offering classes for the children from preschool through elementary. But in order to be prepared for that, we really need to know who's coming. So if you would please sign up, there is um, out in the lobby by where you pick up your communion, um, there's a clipboard. And I'm asking if you would tell us, even if you're signing up as adults, it would be nice to know just so we're prepared. But I'm really more interested in who is coming for um, kids. Middle school and older at this point are going to be able to stay in and watch the chosen with the adults. But we want to have programming for the kids. And we just want to make sure that we have the right amount of materials and the right amount of helpers. So it's really important that we have people sign up for that. If you forget to sign up today and you think, oh, we're going to do that midweek, call me or text me and tell me because I really want to make sure we're prepared. Okay? Again, that doesn't start until September 15th, but we're trying to get ready for that. And we hope to see you there. Do it. Do it. Right, Amber? Yeah. Do it. Uh, yeah, Jerry, did you have something you'd like to share? So if, uh, if that's something, you can put last week's message into action um, by helping our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan. Brought me to tears hearing about it. So just, just for your consideration, um, if you'd like to do that, um, it's called the Nazarene Fund. Just punch in the Nazarene and it comes up on your computer. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's prepare our hearts and minds to uh, worship the Lord in the song. And... Um, Let's see, our first song this morning is, but, oh, sorry, uh, Roger has a, an yes, go ahead, sir. I just want to thank everyone who prayed for my cancer, because we were told last week that they were going to cancel the last session of chemo. <laughs> because you're free. Amen. The other thing I'd like to 
Your what? My toes. Your toes? Yeah, I can't feel it. Okay, can't feel it. <laughs> yeah, Roger, I just getting used to the good looking hair you were getting there, so yeah. unfortunately you're gonna get your hair back and I'll, I'll still be bald and you won't be, so. Well, praise God. Great great reports. Thank you for that, Roger. Let's rise and sing praise to the Lord. <laughs>
Please be seated. As we gather this morning, we have the great privilege of coming before God, bearing our prayers, our praises, our joys, and our concerns. Uh, please take note of the prayer requests that are on your back of your bulletin here today. Uh, a couple of things I just want to highlight here this morning. Please continue to pray for Chris Phillips. Uh, his surgery went well a couple of weeks ago. Um, he is uh, still dealing with some headaches as an after result of that. Uh, that's kind of uh, anticipated. Uh, it's going to be a long recovery for him, but uh, he and Joe uh, expressed uh, their appreciation for all the prayers and support that they've gotten here from our church family. So please continue to keep them in your prayers. Um, Diane, do you have any updates about that? Um, no, just, you know, the only key one restriction was the new Please uh, continue to pray for uh, Peter McLennan, that's uh, Lisa Carmody's husband, uh, Lisa McLennan now. Uh, we'll, uh, please be praying for him as he's in the hospital dealing with COVID. And, uh, Kate Lazar, I believe, had surgery recently. How is she doing? She's doing well. Thank you very much. Thank you for all your prayers. Yeah. Right. Well, we'll, we'll continue to pray for a recovery there. Uh, are there any other uh, prayer requests that we would like to share aloud here this morning? Debbie. Um, our daughter-in-law's brother-in-law um, is in the exact same position as Peter. So just continue to pray for him. And they really don't know Christ. So we are praying that this brings good out of it. Great. What is his name again? Uh, Scott. Scott. Okay. <laughs> we'll be praying for Scott also. Great. I look at Sierra. Vaughn, Charlie Vaughn, 
have a couple of schools that have started. So uh, for those of you who are back in school and for those of you who are teachers who are back in school, uh, praying for a good uh, school year for all of you. Jen. things we have mentioned. Diane, or, or, yeah. I just wanted to give you an update on uh, Sharon McCullough. I don't know if you remember that and Sharon came to church here um, before. She is home after the closure, but she's still on oxygen and is still very weak. But she has been able to come home. So I want to go to the next Now, normally I'm pretty good at remembering old names here for prayer requests. <laughs> There's a lot of them today. <laughs> so if I don't mention these folks by name, it, it is not an intentional slight. The Lord has heard these things. Uh, so let's lift them up. Yes, Brenda. I have a praise report. Yeah. Um, a couple weeks ago, I asked for prayer for my friend Linda, and um, she had had um, biopsy for breast cancer. And praise God, the hers came back okay, benign. So, you know, praying for all the ones that did not, mm -hmm. but praise God that my friend. Praise God for that. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we, we do give you praises for the answered prayers that we have seen. Uh, but Lord, as we live in this fallen world, uh, we see around us uh, so many instances of disease, uh, of suffering, uh, Lord, even death. And so, Lord, we, we lift all of these things we have mentioned this morning to you. Lord, we pray for those who mourn, uh, those who mourn the losses of loved ones. Uh, Lord, we pray for those who are in the midst of illness. Uh, Lord, we, we pray, uh, particularly for Chris, for his continued recovery. Lord, for, uh, for Kate, as she can be recovered from surgery. Lord, for Peter and for all of those who are dealing with COVID. Uh, Lord, uh, for Sierra, for Scott. Lord, we lift all of these individuals to you. We pray for healing. We pray, Lord, for a swift end to this pandemic. Uh, Lord, we pray for all of those who are dealing with these cancer diagnoses and treatments. Uh, Lord, we ask that those would go well, that you would bring healing through your spirit and through, uh, uh, Lord, through the, the gifts of modern medicine that you have given to us. Lord, we, uh, we, we pray for those in the midst of transitions. Uh, Lord, for teachers heading back to school, for students preparing for the first day in a new year. We pray, Lord, that these would go well. Lord, for those embarking on new chapters of their lives, we ask that you would watch over them. And we pray, Lord, for a safe and fun fair here in Wellington this coming week. Lord, we pray for the needs that we see 
all around the world. The Lord, pray for the situation in Haiti. It could uh, become very bad very quickly. We pray that you would raise up your people to bring relief into that nation. And we pray that those who are tasked with uh, administering the relief that comes would be wise and honest in their dealings. Lord, we pray for the nation of Afghanistan. Lord, especially for our brothers and sisters in Christ in that place. We pray, Lord, that you would watch over them, that you would strengthen their faith and trust in you. We pray, Lord, for their safety. We pray, Lord, that they would be faithful in the midst of all trials difficulties that come their way. Lord, be with us here. May we also be faithful, even though it is so much easier for us to follow you here in this place. Lord, we praise you for the freedoms that we enjoy. We thank you for the sacrifice of those who have sought to, to bring that freedom to Afghanistan over the last 20 years. And Lord, we pray that we may not become complacent in our faith in you. Lord, may we do all for your honor and glory. Lord, all of these things that we have mentioned this morning, as well as those that we have left unspoken, we pray, place into your care trusting in you, as we pray also after the pattern that our Lord Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand as we give praise to God for all the ways in which he has blessed us and as we bring to him the offering that we return to him. Let's stand and sing. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Jonah. We're going to spend the next couple of weeks going through this book. And so this morning we are beginning, appropriately enough, Jonah chapter 1. Jonah 1, verses 1 through 17. Hear now the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. 
He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own god, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone down below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your god. Maybe he will take notice of it, and we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the land and the sea. This terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord, because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, What should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, It will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land. But they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried to the Lord, O oh Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, O oh Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and made vows to him. But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. Please pray with me. Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray you open it to us that we might understand what you say to us today. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will be here among us. And the things that I say and the things that are heard and remembered and taken to heart, Lord, they may not be from me, but from you. We pray these things that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The fisherman was talking to one of his friends. He said, let me tell you about the 30-pound bass I caught. Darn thing fought for three hours before I finally landed it. His friend said, well, wait, I saw the picture you posted online. You're lucky if you can weigh 10 pounds. Said the fisherman, well, a fish can lose an awful lot of weight during three hours of fighting. <laughs> Big fish stories are nothing new. But this morning we take a look at one that's actually true in the book of Jonah. Now, if you've spent a lot of time around the church, you're probably familiar with this, especially if you spent time in church as a child. Because we do this thing in, in the church where we find all these Old Testament stories that involve animals, and we kind of put those front and center for our children's programming. Uh, I don't know how many churches I've been in where the, the nursery has a Noah's Ark theme. And you kind of wonder about the decision-making there. Like the committee is trying to figure out, how should we decorate the new nursery? Well, what about that story where people are so wicked that God wipes out all of humanity with a flood except for one guy who gets drunk afterwards? The issue is a little dark. What's about animals? Okay, let's go with that one. We, these stories about animals we find in Scripture are often uh, actually a little terrifying. Uh, but yet, they've got animals. They're, they're cute. We can do that. Uh, and so we are very familiar with a lot of these stories. I mean, if it were me and I was choosing a theme for the nursery, I'd probably go with that verse out of 1 Corinthians. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. <laughs> <laughs> Took a second there, didn't it? <laughs> but 
Well, we've got this story of Jonah, right? Involves an animal, a very big animal. The unusual occurrence of a man spending three days in the belly of a very large maritime creature and coming out alive often attracts notice to this book. It's tucked away with a lot of other tiny books in that part of the Old Testament that unfortunately we don't read a whole lot. There's just some great stuff in there. But there's a lot more to it than just a big fish. We're going to spend the next couple of weeks here in the book of Jonah to see what this story has to say to us. And the first lesson is this. You can't run away from God. You'd think Jonah would have known this already, too. He's a prophet. He's one of the good guys. The prophets are heroes of the Old Testament, not always honored during their lifetimes, but revered in hindsight as faithful wise, godly messengers to a people going astray. The first time Jonah shows up in the Bible is an offhand reference in the book of 2 Kings. In chapter 14, verse 25, we read that King Jeroboam II of Israel restored the border of Israel from Lebo Hamath as far as the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet from Gath-Hefer. For the Lord saw that the affliction of Israel was very bitter, and there was none to help Israel. But the Lord had said he would not blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, so he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. So the situation is bleak. Israel feels alone. And Jonah hears the word of the Lord, delivers the word of the Lord. And when God's people are in desperation, Jonah brings a word that gives hope. What he says comes to pass. That's the mark of a genuine prophet. But in the book that bears his name, Jonah is a reluctant prophet. There's a little bit of a background whine there. Are we uh, working on that? Yeah, somebody's hearing you. Ah, okay. I thought it was my mic, my uh, nope. microphone. Okay. The word of the Lord comes to Jonah. Arise, go to Nineveh, and call out against it. But Jonah doesn't want to go. He's fine proclaiming hope to the Israelites, his own people, God's people, but Nineveh is not an Israelite city. In fact, it's one of the major centers of the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrians are not friends of the Israelites. The Assyrians push them around, invade them, make them pay tribute. And eventually, a few decades after the time of Jonah, the Assyrians destroy the kingdom of Israel. Jonah is not inclined to go proclaim God's judgment to a hostile people in a faraway city. Imagine being told to go deliver the word of God in a place where the authorities do not recognize him, and do not particularly like Americans. Beijing, for instance, or Afghanistan. Picture that, and you might get an idea of how Jonah must feel at being told to go and preach to Nineveh. What if they simply laugh in his face and all that time and effort comes to nothing? What if they're hostile, reject him, Maybe even hurt him or even kill him. <laughs> or what if they actually listen and repent? What if his enemies are spared God's wrath and prosper? And so Jonah goes down to the port of Java and gets on a ship bound for Tarshish. Now, Jonah was located, excuse me, now Nineveh was located in what is now northern Iraq. 
As a matter of fact, even though the city is long gone, there is still a province in Iraq named Nineveh province. Tarshish, on the other hand, is about as far in the opposite direction as you can get. It was most likely located near the modern city of Cadiz, which is on the Atlantic coast of Spain. A voyage to Tarshish from Israel in those days could have taken as long as three years. And in fact, in the Bible, a byword for large ships that go on long ocean voyages is ships of Tarshish. As far as the, know, the world was known at that time, Tarshish was at the very end of it. So Jonah is trying to get as far away from where he is supposed to be as he could possibly get. Jonah, the scripture tells us, was attempting to flee from the presence of the Lord. Because not only is Tarshish far away from Nineveh, it's about as far away from the land of Israel as you could get to. But it doesn't work. Of course it doesn't. God isn't confined to one geographical area or even one area of life. Running from God does not bring Jonah peace. It gets him and those around him into greater storms. Again, you'd think Jonah would have known that. And you'd think we'd know it too. But really, when we take time to think about it, this guy Jonah is a lot like us. We who believe in Jesus, who trust him, we have a relationship with God. We know his word. We want to serve him. But sometimes God asks us to do things that we just don't want to do. He asks us to serve people we'd rather not have anything to do with. To change something in our lives we really don't want to let go of. To get out of our comfort zone in some way. And so we run. We try to put some distance between us and God in hopes that he'll just leave us alone. We stay away from church or stay out of our Bibles. <laughs> Or maybe we just try to wall off a certain part of our life. God, you can have the rest of it, but just not this one. I'm going to keep this one for myself. And it doesn't work. Following our ways instead of God's ways is what got humanity into the mess of sin and death in the first place. It's why we live in a fallen world. And trying to run from God today only takes us further from life and hope. It's often only when the inevitable storm arises that we realize that turning away from God is not a good idea. We should have figured that out earlier, but sometimes we're the last ones to see our own blind spots. Just like Jonah. The irony in this story is that Jonah, the prophet, does not act like a man of faith and wisdom, while the pagan crew of the ship seems attuned to the spiritual aspects of the situation. When the storm blows up, they ask their gods for help. They don't get any, of course, because their gods aren't real, but they still try. They look for divine guidance by casting lots. They go get Jonah to ask him to pray, too. They're acting out of ignorance. They don't know the Lord, but they're seeking. And they're looking in, in the right place. They're looking for a, a spiritual answer to the storm they've encountered. Jonah, in contrast, is asleep in the moment of crisis. And when the sailors find out what Jonah has done, they're terrified. They fear the power of God when Jonah, who ought to have known better, simply launched into this misadventure in the first place. Yet Jonah still does not seem to have learned his lesson. 
he still does not turn back to God. He tries to fix the problem on his own terms. He tells the crew to throw him overboard. They're naturally aghast at this idea to do as Jonah asked would be a death sentence in that kind of sea. And they do everything in their power to avoid it. But finally, with the storm getting no better, they do as Jonah asks. The storm stops. The men stand amazed at the power of God. But Jonah does not drown. The Lord, the scripture tells us, appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. Once again, we see the futility of trying to flee from God to follow our plans and desires. But we also see the mercy of God. Even when we turn away from him, God pursues us. He won't let us be. And sometimes there are storms. Sometimes there is anguish. But God also provides a way out. God sends his prophet to a foreign people because he cares. God sends a fish for his wayward prophet because he cares. God sent the Lord Jesus to die for you and me to bring us into his kingdom because he cares. Jonah, despite knowing all sorts of things about God, doesn't quite get it. You and I, we should learn from this. Don't run from God thinking you can escape his presence. Follow him. Let's pay attention to what he calls us to do in his word and by his spirit, and then let's do it. And if you have been running from God, if you have been trying to keep him at arm's length, if you're tired of being caught in the storm, know that God offers mercy. There's another way, a better way. We find it in trusting and following Christ instead of charting our own. Please pray with me. Oh Lord, we thank you for your mercy, even when we are apt to go astray. And Lord, we gather here at this table to partake of the bread and of the cup as these symbols and reminders of your mercy to us. Lord, as we gather here, not because we are righteous, but because you are good and gracious towards us. We pray that you take these elements and turn them from an ordinary use to a sacred use for this night. That we may be nourished. That we may be called back to you. That we would cease running away and set our feet once more on the path that you have set before us. Lord, as we gather here, we partake of the bread and of the cup, we proclaim your death, Lord Jesus, until you come again. And in your death, we find true life. We remember that on the night that he was arrested, the Lord Jesus gathered his disciples, those same disciples who also would shortly run away, seek their own ways instead of walking with the Lord. And as he gathered with them and shared in the meal, he gave them this reminder of his grace. He embodied for them in the bread and the cup what he was about to do. 
to atone for their sins, the ones they had committed and the ones they would yet commit. And so we recall on the night he was arrested, the Lord Jesus took bread and he blessed it. He broke it. He gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance. Same way after supper, the Lord Jesus took the cup. He gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for the remission of sins. Drink all of you. Lord, we praise you for this act of communion that you have given to us, to bind us together as your people. And Lord, we praise you for your grace that welcomes us, even when we have been running from you. Lord, you delight when we turn again and follow your way. May we cease running from you and trust and obey. Instead, Amen. Let's stand as we conclude our service with our final song this morning. Trust and obey. may you go forth in the love of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
And may the grace and the mercy of God abide with you and grant you peace this day and always. Amen. Thank you.